Hello, I'm Doug Jensen. I'm a freelance director of photography and owner of Vortex Media. If you own a professional Sony camcorder, then you may have heard of me before because I've been writing and producing independent masterclass training videos and field guide books for Sony cameras since 2005. Those cameras include the F55, the FS7, the FS5, the Z150, the Tiny Z90, and most recently, the Z190 and its brother, the Z280. In fact, the Z280 has now become the camera that I use most often, even though I also own an F55 and an FS7. And I sure didn't see that coming 10 months ago when I bought my Z280 and began production on my six hour masterclass training series for the camera. I never would have predicted that I'd like my Z280 as much as I do, and that it would become my go-to camera for most of my shooting. Now, why do I like the Z280 so much? Well, honestly, that's a hard question to answer briefly because there are so many things to talk about, including several 4K 10-bit 422 recording formats at up to 60 frames per second, a fantastic OLED viewfinder, the camera's compact size and weight, the electronic variable neutral density filter, high dynamic range, four channels of 24-bit audio, onboard custom clip naming, and the list goes on and on. But what really sets the Z280 apart from my other cameras is its amazing 17x f1.9 lens. This feature is what makes the Z280 a true ENG camera that is perfect for shooting situations where you need to have a wide range of focal lengths, but stopping to change lenses is simply not an option. In other words, with the Z280, I get a small, portable, no-nonsense camera that has most of the high-end features and specifications found on my more expensive cinema cameras but I get the convenience and efficiency that comes from having a traditional 17x ENG zoom lens made by Fujinon, the world's leading manufacturer of two-thirds inch ENG lenses. Lenses, by the way, that can typically cost more than $20,000 when they have similar specifications to the lens that comes standard on the Z280. But in the world of cinema cameras, DSLRs, and mirrorless cameras, there are no professional quality lenses that can touch what the Z280 offers, even if you have tens of thousands of dollars to spend. Those kinds of lenses just don't exist for cameras with large sensors. As I said, the Z280's lens has a 17x zoom range that provides an equivalent field of view when compared to super 35mm cameras like the FS7 and FS5 from about 310mm at full telephoto to about 18mm at the widest focal length and everything in between at a moment's notice. That is what an ENG lens is all about. Plus, you get a fast f1.9 maximum aperture, servo zoom control, auto focusing when you need it, precision manual focusing when you want that instead, a dedicated iris ring for easy exposure control, and of course, let's not forget, excellent picture quality. I mean, all the coolest features in the world aren't worth anything if the picture quality isn't there too, which fortunately it is. I know from personal experience, having used my own camera and a few other Z280s for almost a year now, that the lens on the Z280 is tack sharp and looks gorgeous at all focal lengths when used properly. And that's really the key, isn't it? Like any high performance piece of equipment, the Z280 must be used properly if you expect to get consistently professional results. Now, despite its small size, the Z280 isn't a consumer handycam, and it's not an entry level camcorder that you can simply turn on and start shooting with. And that brings me to my reason for producing this video. There is rarely a week goes by that a potential Z280 buyer doesn't contact me about concerns they have regarding the performance of the lens, all because of a few critical reviews they read online, reviews that I happen to strongly disagree with. So in this video, I'd like to address those concerns and show you a few simple techniques for ensuring that you get the maximum performance and picture quality from your Z280. I mean, clearly, I'm a big fan of the Z280, and as I've said, I shoot with it more often than any of my other cameras. And even though it isn't perfect, we'll talk more about that in a minute, it is an excellent workhorse camera for all kinds of shooting situations, and I have no qualms about using it on a daily basis. One of the first things you need to do when your Z280 arrives is to check the back focus. Your camera has traveled thousands of miles on its way to your doorstep. It may have been bumped and jostled along the way, and it was probably subjected to extreme temperatures. All good reasons why you need to check the back focus as soon as possible.
Now, if you're an experienced camera operator who has used ENG cameras in the past, then you already know this procedure is mandatory for new cameras, new lenses, and equipment that has traveled long distances. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked into a technical discussion about back focus, lenses, and optics. But if you find that your camera's focus is sharp when the lens is zoomed in, but soft when zoomed out, then your back focus needs adjusting. Now, to check the back focus on your Z280, just follow these steps. First, put the camera on the full manual focus mode by sliding the focus ring on the lens to the rear position. You'll see the words full MF in the viewfinder. Second, set the aperture on the lens to f2.8. And then, if necessary, adjust the other exposure controls, such as the variable neutral density filter dial, to produce a correct exposure. Now, the exposure doesn't need to be perfect, but it should be in the right ballpark. Third, zoom in on something that is at least 20 to 30 feet away. The farther, the better. And then focus the lens manually so the subject is perfectly sharp. You should absolutely use peaking and or focus magnification in the viewfinder to assist you. And fourth, zoom out slowly while looking at the subject you focus on. Does it stay sharp all the way through, especially when you reach the widest focal length? You may need to zoom in and out a few times to really get a good look at it. Now the back focus on my camera looks perfect and hopefully yours will too, but let's pretend that we see a problem that needs to be fixed. Fortunately, correcting the back focus on a Z280 is a lot easier than on other ENG lenses. All removable ENG lenses, like those used on shoulder mount cameras such as the PXW Z450, have a back focus adjustment ring at the rear of the lens. You have to loosen it up and then manually adjust the back focus by hand while looking through the viewfinder. It's tricky to do and takes practice. But adjusting the back focus on the Z280 is automated. All we have to do is make sure the camera is set up correctly according to the instructions that can be found on pages 45 and 46 of Sony's Z280 operation manual and the onboard computer will do the heavy lifting for us. And it's my belief that this is where a lot of Z280 owners get it wrong. I've had several people tell me that they adjusted the back focus on their camera and it still had a problem. But guess what? Every single time I questioned the person about their back focusing procedure, all of them were doing it incorrectly. I cannot stress enough how important it is to follow Sony's instructions to the letter. No matter how you may have adjusted the back focus on other cameras in the past, you need to follow the specific instructions Sony provides for the Z280. Now, this is a subject I already covered in my Z280 Masterclass, and I don't want to do it all over again, so I'm going to insert that segment now. I've already had to fix the back focus on my Z280 once, so I know that this is more than just a hypothetical issue that can arise. Fortunately, we can take care of it on our own in a matter of minutes. I'll press the menu button, choose the camera tab, and go to the auto flange back adjust menu. Unfortunately, you can see that it's grayed out right now and cannot be selected. Why is that? Well, because the camera needs to be set up very specifically in order for this function to do its job correctly. So a few things are going to need to be changed before we can proceed. Even if this menu is not grayed out, please pay special attention to the steps I'm about to tell you. Step one, go to LCD viewfinder, marker, and turn the setting menu on. And then program the center marker to anything but off. I prefer number three. Step two, go to System, Record Format, and set the frequency for either 59.94 or 50, and set the video format for 4K. Step three, make sure the full auto mode is turned off and set the shutter speed, gain, and iris to the following settings. Shutter speed, auto shutter, gain, 0 dB, and iris fully open at f1.9. If you're not sure how to adjust those settings, please refer to chapter 12. Step 4, set the zoom switch on the bottom of the camcorder to servo. Step 5, place a high contrast subject such as a well-lit back focus chart about 10 to 12 feet away from the camera. The bigger the chart, the better. But it doesn't have to be an official chart. Anything with high contrast and lots of detail can work just fine. Place the chart so that it appears at the center of the frame when you zoom in. Also, make sure that there are no objects closer to the camera that will come into view when the lens is zoomed out. 
Step six, use the variable ND filter or adjust the lighting so that the exposure is approximately correct. The chart doesn't need to be perfectly exposed, but it does need to be close. And finally, step seven, go to the auto flange back adjust menu, select it, and then execute. During the adjustment, the in progress message is displayed. When the adjustment has finished, the completion message will be shown and the camera should be ready to start shooting. Okay, now that we're sure the back focus is working correctly, let's address the next issue I believe is causing some people grief with their Z280. That issue is called diffraction and it's easy to avoid. As seen in this split screen example with the picture mirrored on each side, diffraction is a loss of sharpness or resolution that is caused by shooting at small f-stops. I shot this street scene with the aperture set to f16 and then again at f2.8. Notice that the image on the left has an overall soft look to it. I'd describe it as being kind of mushy. There's almost no detail left in the bricks or the stoplight. On the other hand, look how much sharper and crisper the picture looks on the right when the aperture is set to f2.8. Here's another example with f16 on the left and f2.8 on the right. And here's one more example. This time I'll start with the f16 version of the shot full screen and then slowly wipe from left to right to reveal the same shot at f2.8. I don't know how it looks to you on the web, but on my monitors the difference is like night and day. It's especially noticeable in the signs on the side of the buildings. Take another look as I transition from F16 to F2.8 one more time. Diffraction is a problem that's not unique to the Z280, and it occurs to varying degrees with all lenses and all cameras. But on a camera like the Z280 that has relatively small half-inch image sensors, the problem can be more noticeable, which can lead some people who are used to shooting with cameras that have bigger sensors to blame the camera or lens for not being sharp enough. But the camera's not at fault, it's just the physics of light. Diffraction happens because light begins to disperse or diffract when it passes through a small aperture, such as an f-stop of f16, f11, or even f8. When the lens is stopped down to a small aperture, the finest details in the image can begin to blur and cause the overall image to become soft. This unwanted side effect is of particular concern outdoors in bright light and high contrast. Now I've been worrying about this phenomenon in all my masterclass training videos and workshops for more than a decade. Fortunately, the solution is simple. All you have to do is shoot with the aperture of the lens set within a stop or two of being wide open. I guarantee that will absolutely give you the crispest, sharpest, best looking images on the Z280 or any other video camera for that matter. Now I can honestly say that I have never shot any footage in the last 20 years that was not shot within two stops of the lens being fully open. That's just common operating procedure among experienced professionals and it's nothing new or revolutionary. In fact, that's exactly the reason why professional television and video cameras all have built in ND filters so that the operator can always keep the aperture as close to wide open as possible. On the Z280, that means I never shoot with an f-stop smaller than f4. My aperture is always set within the range of f1.9 to f4 in order to avoid the effects of diffraction and ensure the sharpest, most pleasing images possible. This is especially easy to accomplish with the Z280 due to its amazing variable neutral density filter. I just set the aperture where I want it and then I do all my exposure adjustments by varying the intensity of the ND filter. A second benefit of keeping the aperture nearly wide open is that it also helps me maintain a shallower depth of field, thus giving my footage a more cinematic look. And the third benefit of keeping the aperture nearly wide open is that it actually makes manual focusing a lot easier. Now it might sound counterintuitive that having a shallower depth of field would make focusing easier, but it absolutely does if you know how to use the camera's peaking function. However, that is a topic for another day. The bottom line is that if you want to avoid the ugly effects of diffraction and consistently capture sharper and crisper footage, just remember to keep your aperture between f1.9 and f4. Very simple. The third complaint I hear people making about the lens on the Z280 is that it has some barrel distortion. And to a certain extent, those complaints are valid. 
Yes, there is some minor barrel distortion when the lens is zoomed all the way out to the widest focal length. In fact, barrel distortion, meaning that straight lines near the edge of the frame appear to curve inwards in the shape of a barrel, is quite common on many wide-angle lenses. And please don't make the mistake of confusing barrel distortion with perspective convergence, commonly known as keystoning. Keystoning is when straight lines seem to converge towards the vertical center of the image, such as when the camera is aimed upwards to shoot a tall building. Because the top of the building is further away from the camera than the bottom of the building, the top will appear smaller in the frame, just like a road that is receding into the distance. Keystoning is very common in photography unless you happen to have a special tilt-shift lens, which obviously is not possible to use on the Z280. But my point is that keystoning is not the same thing as barrel distortion. Barrel distortion happens because the field of view of the lens is wider than the size of the image sensor, and thus it needs to be squeezed to fit. As a result, straight lines may become visibly curved inwards, especially towards the extreme edges of the frame. Here's an example of barrel distortion on the Z280 while shooting at the widest focal length. Can you see the curvature around the edges? No? Well, here's another example. You must be able to see some barrel distortion now if the problem is as noticeable as some people claim it is in the reviews of the camera. Well, if you can't see the barrel distortion in those examples, you're not alone because neither can I. And that's why I wanted to show them to you first. In my opinion, the complaints about barrel distortion on the Z280 have been blown far out of proportion. But to be fair, here's another example that does show some barrel distortion. This is the most extreme example of barrel distortion that I've been able to come up with so far. This clip was shot with my Z280 zoomed out to the widest focal length with the camera aimed directly perpendicular towards the garage door and with the camera placed just far enough back so that the perimeter of the door would run along the edges of the frame which is where the distortion is always going to be most noticeable. So there's no question about it. The Z280 does exhibit some barrel distortion under just the right circumstances. But the question you must ask yourself is if it makes any difference to you or not. That is up to each individual to decide for him or herself. Is the possibility of having a little barrel distortion once in a while going to outweigh all the other amazing features the Z280 offers? Or can you just ignore it and move on? And tell the truth, would you have even noticed barrel distortion if it wasn't brought to your attention by someone else? Now, I'm well aware of the issue, and I can honestly say that it doesn't matter to me at all. I never even give barrel distortion a moment's thought when I'm out on a shoot. Now, you're free to have a different opinion if you want to, but for me, it's a non-issue. Nevertheless, let's take a closer look at a couple of things you can do to mitigate the possibility of seeing barrel distortion and also how you can make it disappear completely in post with just a couple of mouse clicks if you ever need to. First of all, the distortion is going to be most visible when you have the camera zoomed out to the widest focal length. Notice that the zoom indicator in the viewfinder says zero and you can see that both the left and right sides of the sign are bowed outwards a little bit. I'll superimpose a couple of vertical lines so that you can see the curvature more clearly. Now maybe this distortion bothers you and maybe it doesn't, but let's say that you do want to eliminate it. That's easy to do by zooming in until the zoom indicator says 6 or maybe 7. Now look at the sign. It's nice and straight on both sides with no more distortion. And all we've given up is a few millimeters of our widest focal length. If you want to keep the same framing that we had before, that's easy to do by just moving the camera back a little bit. Here's another example. At full wide, I do see some barrel distortion in the columns to either side of this old warehouse door. But if I move the camera back, only a couple of feet, and zoom in a little to keep the same framing, the distortion is gone. This is a very simple way of eliminating barrel distortion anytime you think it's an issue. Another method of mitigating barrel distortion is to avoid shooting straight into walls, windows, doors, or anything else that has strong vertical or horizontal lines. I hope you'll agree with me that this shot of the garage door is boring and not very pleasing from this angle, even if there wasn't any barrel distortion to worry about. So with that in mind, what if we move the camera over a little bit and come at the garage door from more of a 45 degree angle? Now I think that is not only a better shot, but any distortion is going to be much less evident, even though the lens is still zoomed out to the widest focal length. But sometimes zooming in a little bit or shooting from a different angle may not be an option. So let's say that for whatever reason, you've got barrel distortion in one of your shots and you want to get rid of it. Fortunately, that's very easy to do in post. 
Now I edit with Adobe Premiere, so I'll show you how to accomplish it in that program, but I'm sure similar controls exist in Final Cut Pro, Avid, or whatever professional NLE software you happen to use. Going back to our head-on shot of the garage door, watch how easy it is for me to correct the distortion. With the clip on a timeline in Adobe Premiere, I go to Video Effects, then Lens Distortion, and apply the effect to the clip. Then I go over to the Effects Settings and set the Curvature Control to minus 8. Now look at the garage door. The distortion is entirely gone. Here's before and after. Before and after. Here's another example that has some barrel distortion. Before and after. Before and after. The correction is seamless and simple to do. I can even save this effect as a new preset in Premiere so I can apply it even faster to any clips in the future that I feel have some barrel distortion, which as I said is very rare, but now I've got a quick fix whenever it's needed. Now, I hope this brief video has put any concerns you may have had about the Z280's lens to rest, and that my shooting tips will help you get even better performance from your camera. Believe me, if the Z280 wasn't every bit as great as I'm telling you it is, I wouldn't be using it myself. Happy shooting.